Hello, everyone. This is Cindy McDonald, and we want to welcome you to our Guided Path webinar today. It's the Naked Roommate by the author of The Naked Roommate, Harlan Cohen, and the webinar we're doing today is Naked College Planning, Search, Selection, and Transition. I'm so glad to have you here today. We thank you for joining us. We are recording this session, so you will have access we are going to post the slides that Harlan is going to be sharing with you today. Those will be posted on our website, and Harlan will have, will have a recording posted both on his website and our website as well. So be looking for an email after this webinar with all this information. And as we go through this webinar, it's going to be one hour in length, plus or minus. I know that there's everybody's really anxious and interested in the things that Harlan has to share. We want to make sure that you're using your GoToMeeting well and that you have good sound and good vision. So you, in your GoToMeeting box, you should see a place where you can raise your hand. And if you could go and click on that box and raise your hand, then both Harlan and I can see your hand being raised. So take a moment, find your GoToMeeting um, box, and find a place where you can raise your hand. Okay, I see lots of hands raised, students. That's, that's great. Because Harlan might be asking you some questions, and you'll need to raise your hand in order to answer those questions. The other way that we use to interact on our webinars is to use the question and action section. So the, you can go to your GoToMeeting box, and you'll see a place where you can enter in a question. So this would be a good time. Find that question section and enter in a note. Say, hi, glad to be here. It's Wednesday, whatever. And then that way you'll know where the question section is. Because that's the best way for us to be able to have an interaction. Both Harlan and I would much rather be in a room with you personally to be able to share this webinar. But the beauty of doing a webinar like this is that you can be wherever you are, whatever time zone, country, um, place you are in the world, and we're still able to share that. So we're very glad to have that. And I see lots of notes coming in. So thank you, everyone. And if you haven't found your question section yet, continue looking. It's on the GoToMeeting little dialog box. If it's collapsed, it might be in a corner somewhere on your computer, and you can click on the arrow, and it should open it up. My name is Cindy McDonald. I am the host for this webinar. This is hosted by Guided Path. Um, we're an online college planning tool, and we believe in professional development. This is our passion, is to help you help your students get more students, or help you get more students to college. So with that, I want to introduce and turn you over to the time over to Harlan. And thank you, Harlan, for being here today and participating and sharing with us this exciting concept. And um, everyone's very anxious and interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to turn the time over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. I am so excited to be here with everybody. And um, thank you all for taking time out of your ridiculously busy days uh, to participate in this. Um, whenever I talk to people in counseling, uh, I'm always really nervous because I know you have like a million things going on. So I'm really grateful to be here and to spend this time with you. Um, I want to make sure you know that I'm here. I'm going to hit the, the microphone or the, uh, the uh, what is this, to actually see me. I don't know if you can actually see me here, um, but I just wanted to wave to you so that you can see that I am here with you live and so excited to be here. It's a big smile. So I'm going to turn this off, and later I may turn this on when we do Q&A. So please uh, keep your questions coming. Cindy's going to ask me these questions and filter through those later on in the webinar. So many of you I have met. Uh, many of you I have not met, and I would love to meet you because this is my life, and I want to get to know you really well. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of background and uh, then we can begin getting into really what this is all about. So I'm a syndicated advice columnist. I've been writing my column since I was in college, uh, you know, many years ago. And uh, this role as an advice columnist has, has really given me a window into people's lives. 
and it's helped to be able to connect the dots so that I can identify even larger trends. I actually still write my advice column. If you're in Minnesota, you can uh, read it every week and uh, in Pittsburgh and some other cities as well. So I'm also a speaker. I visit over 400 college campuses all over the country. I also talk to high school students and parents. You'll see a lot of pictures uh, during this webinar and many of these are ones that I've actually taken while visiting these college campuses, which I always find to be so exciting because the architecture is always so interesting. But what's nice is I'm on the ground. Like I am there talking to the students who you have advised and helping them through this big transition. And then what's nice is I'm also now working with a lot more high schools and, and I'll share more about how I've started to make the shift to really address some bigger issues before students arrive on campus. I'm also author of a bunch of books. Uh, most of you are familiar with The Naked Roommate, uh, The Naked Roommate for Parents Only, and then I have a Naked Roommate First Year Survival Workbook. So I'll share more about these support materials as well. Uh, but I'm grateful for those of you who have um, bought The Naked Roommate and Naked Roommate for Parents Only. And uh, my wife is also grateful. And my children. I have three kids. I have um, an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a, um, a one-year-old. And we just started our college search for the one-year-old, by the way. So, you know, I'll be needing many of you uh, once this webinar ends, especially for the one-year-old. So let's go through the agenda of what I'm going to be covering today. And there's a lot to cover. I'm going to try and get through everything. Uh, I can dig deeper in the Q&A part of this, but uh, this will give you a sense of where we're going to be going. So I want to begin by sharing a little bit about my first year in college because it was miserable and awful and this is why I do what I do. Then reflect on college planning in its current state and why there are some big problems that we can address. Turning into search, selection, and transition, and transition is really going to be the big focus here. And then a layer deeper, places, people, and patients. And then how to use transition to really drive college search. Because really what we want to do is we, we want to change how students are living life in their environments. And it really begins with us. And then we're going to give you some materials to support you. There's a lot of really cool stuff that I'm developing and stuff I'd like to develop with you. And then your Q&A. So let's get into the nakedness. There is not any nakedness. That's just an expression for exposing the truth. Okay, I know there are some parochial schools here, and I want you to know I'm very. I, I was at Villanova the other day, and they brought me back for a second year. That was really surprising. Um, my college search was so awful. I knew I wanted a Big Ten school, and the reason I knew I wanted a Big Ten school was because. My brothers went to Indiana University, and my dad went to Ohio State, and I'm from Chicago, and people just go to Big Ten schools. So I'm like, okay, that's what I'll do. I didn't know about all of these amazing other schools that I visited, and in retrospect, I would have been so much better off at, I think, some of these other schools. Maybe like a 5,000 school like a Miami of Ohio, I think would have been interesting, or Elon. Um, my college search also consisted of wanting to be close to my high school girlfriend because basically that is that was all I really had that I loved. I loved her so much and I joked that I didn't really know why she loved me because I didn't really love myself because who really does love themselves in high school and I was too afraid to ask her why she liked me because I didn't want her to think about it and um, break up. That'd be awful. Um, I went to uh, I went, during my search. I didn't want to know people. I wanted to start off fresh. That was really important to me. So uh, Wisconsin was a place where I didn't know anybody. Uh, I thought that would be a really good place to to start. So I ended up at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I love this picture. I was actually on campus the other day, and I took this picture, and it was the most beautiful, amazing day. I mean, how anyone can struggle in such a beautiful environment is like it's almost incomprehensible but yet I was never so miserable in my life during my first year in college I didn't know people so my roommate needed to be my friend and unfortunately my roommate was not my friend my roommate liked to smoke a lot of pot 
and that I didn't know about the shrub. I wasn't familiar with the shrub, and and I was intimidated. I didn't smoke pot, and the guy moved out so he can live with someone else. So my roommate was not my friend, and there's this expectation that a roommate needs to be a friend, especially students who don't have any friends. You want your roommate to be, and that was my fault. That shouldn't have been the right expectation, but that was really upsetting to me. I also didn't get into a fraternity. The guys on my floor, I hung out with them, and they all got bids, invitations to join. Everybody got in but me. So I was rejected by the fraternity. So the guys who I became friends with became my ex-friends, and my roommate moved out, so I was working in a negative direction here. The next thing that happened is my girlfriend shot the puppy, and there was, not actually, there was, there was no actually shooting, no actual shooting involved. Uh, she was a senior in high school. And I was a freshman in college, and we did the long distance thing. And her father compared our relationship to a dying puppy. And he urged uh, Alexis, that was her name, still her name, uh, to shoot the puppy. So she shot the puppy. And here I was. And let me tell you, I was like, I was a really exceptional student by the time I graduated. I had a miserable transition to high school, which, which I'll, I'll share a little bit about that with you later because there's a pattern here. Uh, but I, was, I won the principal's award. Uh, I come from a school where you know almost everybody goes to a four-year school. Uh, you know, we all go to college. That's just what we do. And I had wonderful advising and, and really nice grades. And uh, I was miserable. I failed not academically. I failed to find my way this first year at Madison, a beautiful campus, University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, what I did is I left. I transferred. I became one of the statistics. And where did I go? I went to Indiana University. Now, you might be thinking, that's a little crazy. Why Indiana? But the reason I went to Indiana is because both my brothers graduated from IU. My brother, uh, Vic, is, is uh, eight years older. My other brother, Mike, is five years older. They both had an amazing experience. I was visiting there since I was 10 years old. And I also had some from friends from high school who went there. So I knew people, it was comfortable, and the best part, there was a fraternity that had to accept me because my brothers were in uh, AE Pi at Indiana University, and I was a legacy. So they had no choice, and I was okay with that. So I transferred from Madison. I went to Indiana. I was the only one in my family who transferred, and I get to Indiana, and surprisingly, I was just as uncomfortable there as I was at IU. I was so miserable that first semester. But, you know, it's like I, I kind of knew the taste and the texture, and I was able to get through it. Like, I knew I knew that being uncomfortable was, was kind of part of it, and I, I had enough connection where I was able to survive. So I made it through my second first year in college. I call it my second first year because anytime I do something the first time, I'm awful. Um, but the second time, I get a little bit better. And it was after I found my places at the college newspaper, the Indiana Daily Student, and um, being a song leader as part of my fraternity. That gave me a leadership position. I had things to do. And then I, I, I was a founding member of an improv troupe. So I found my places and, and my people, and I found connections. And, and, and it was able, I was able to make it a lot better. And after writing my advice column and living this experience, I discovered something so shocking that no one ever told me in high school. And I don't know if you tell your, your students this, because it's not something that, that uh, anyone ever told me. And it's, it's really simple, and it really helps. And you need to tell your students this. The first year of college is supposed to be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for students, and it's uncomfortable for their parents. I'm curious. If you could use your, your question box, how many of you tell the students you're advising that the first year is uncomfortable? If you can just give me a give me a yes or give me a no, this idea that the first year in college is uncomfortable. So I'd say, you know, there, there's a little bit of a split. We have some we have some yeses, but I would say, you know, it's 50-50, uh, yes, uh, but not not overwhelming you know and then there are some people who do oh and someone actually gives my book I like that my family likes that thank you very much <laughs> no, I really appreciate it I joke but um, I'm really glad that 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 you do do that 
because my job is to help students and parents understand that uncomfortable is part of it. But high school is not about uncomfortable. High school is about comfortable. And college search and selection is all about beauty and prestige rather than uncomfortable. The first year in any first year, anybody who transitions, it's uncomfortable. Transitions are inherently uncomfortable. So why is the first year in college so uncomfortable? And the answer is navigating first is, is difficult. You know, first uh, job, uh, first relationship, making new friends, living with someone for the first time, all of these things are so challenging. The firsts are incredibly uncomfortable. The other reason it's so hard is, is because high school students stink at managing the uncomfortable. And a lot of times it's because everybody else has managed the uncomfortable for them. And the environment of high school isn't one that welcomes uncomfortable. It's about protecting students from the uncomfortable. And when students get uncomfortable and when certain parents hear about students getting uncomfortable, administrators have to respond. And the response is, we want to shield you from anything that makes you uncomfortable because we want you to be safe and secure. But at the end of the day, what we're doing is we are strangling students' abilities to navigate adversity and they have no emotional tolerance and coping skills when they have to navigate the uncomfortable. They have no practice. Many high school students, they haven't had to manage change in their lives. They've had the same friends, home address, and same lives. And this is, this is the world I lived in, and I didn't even recognize it. And this is why this approach is so great for parents, like getting parents on this page, recognizing that, that there are all of these firsts. And what's great is, and I'm going to get to this, is that you already have a baseline because the transition from middle school to high school a lot of these same elements come into play. And really, the transition from one familiar situation to an uh, unfamiliar situation, it's all universal. These are life skills. And change is really hard. I hate change, especially, especially when I buy something for like a um, dollar two, you know, and they give you 98 cents. It's an awful joke. I'm sorry, but I do. So first year is uncomfortable. I want to give you some facts. Many of you are familiar with these facts. I was at an event at UW Platteville the other day. Um, they actually use a naked roommate as part of their first year text. Uh, and um, they do a lot of really cool things with it. But I was there talking to all their first year students. And then the next day I had a chance to visit with the, um, the classes, the first year experience courses. And one of the, the uh, students in the class, I asked what one of the takeaways was for you. And she said, the statistics, the facts were really helpful. And if there's any facts or stats that you share with your students that are helpful, write those in the question box uh, because we're going to share these, these, this information later so that you can tap into these resources. Uh, but these first year facts, the students really love to hear them. I mean, they hate to hear them, but they love to hear them because it helps them to know they're not alone. And this speaks to the uncomfortable part. So approximately one in four students will not return to the same school their sophomore year, which is amazing to me. Now, many of you work with students who, who go to highly selective schools, and that number is smaller. But what I've discovered is at these very selective institutions, and I had a, a wonderful event at Yale, uh, it's that when students are at these places, they're not necessarily happier. They just can't leave because they've worked so hard. Who is going to leave this place where they've spent so much time and energy and their parents are so invested? So the students are there, but they don't know, they don't know how to navigate this new change, which again is where we can give them these skills. 61% of students felt homesick or lonely. That's two-thirds. And I tell students when I'm doing uh, events on campus, celebrate your homesickness. You know, I celebrate all the uncomfortable. I like to celebrate these facts, and we don't just celebrate them, we give them a plan which I'm going to get to. Half of students have problems with roommates. I know uh, one of you asked about roommates, and I can share uh, some strategies for roommates uh, later. Most students have never lived with someone, let alone living with a stranger, and then they're supposed to manage their lives while dealing with 
uh, someone sleeping next to them, you know, staring at them when they wake up, having a roommate, which is strange. Uh, half the students are intimidated by their professors. When students struggle with their grades, I, I ask them why they didn't get help, and they say they're afraid of looking stupid, and I tell them, your professors grade your papers. They know the secret, right? We have to celebrate the uncomfortable. 77.2% 70, of male students and 91% of students, female students felt overwhelmed. And then there's another stat I didn't include, which is a third of students uh, suffered debilitating depression at some point during their college career. I mean, a third. And most of the time, or a lot of times, um, you know, these new medical conditions will begin when a student's in their late teens and 20s. So here's the, here's the big picture. There is an epidemic. Students are, are in pain. They're having an incredibly difficult time finding connection, and they don't know what to do. And we wonder why so many students drink and do drugs and, and, and struggle. It's because there is a much bigger transition taking place that goes beyond the academics. And this is where I began to see this disconnect. Because as I visit all these schools and I talk to all these students and I hear their stories, and I've been doing this for 15 years, I've been visiting these schools, even more so than that. Gosh, I'm getting old. Uh, I see that these problems, they're not just starting in college. These issues are beginning in high school. They're beginning in middle school. They're beginning in elementary school. And then college is the first time students are on their own. So I thought, instead of focusing solely on college students, let's focus on the high school part of this. What is missing? Right now, college planning consists of two pieces. Search, which can begin as early as eighth grade. You know, a fun time to explore, but every student will tell you it's overwhelming. I mean, where do I even begin? And then once you apply, there's selection. And many of you have great approaches to helping school, helping your, your students to be able to, to decipher what's the best school after selection. But there's a third piece of this that will make your life easier and can help students to be much more self-directed. The third part and the most important part of college planning is called transition. How many of you use the word transition or include transition as part of your college planning? Can you give me a yes or no? Is transition part of your college planning? And if it's and if it's not, you know, that's that's okay. And if it is, it will be really interesting for me to discover just how deep you go in transition and how you can help your, your, your students to really use transition to guide them. Now, transition is the period of time after uh, selection through the end of the first year in college. It's when students succeed, survive, or struggle. And this is where I come in, and this is where I see those students. And I would say in terms of transition, um, it's really 50-50, and, and I know one of you, and I don't identify your names unless you, you'd like me to, but one of you put no with an unhappy face, and you know what? You're so wonderful. You're here, and please don't have an unhappy face. I think this is this is such a wonderful topic because we we can we can change this and um, and redefine what this whole college planning is. So transition is the most important part of the process. So I study transition, and what's really cool about this, I'm going to give you the five major components of transition is you can apply this to your own life. You know, we are constantly in a state of transition. Life is a transition from high school to college, from college to the workplace, from one career to another. I know many of you who are independent consultants, you have made a big transition at some point. And the fundamentals of how you made that transition can be applied to this as well. When it comes to the college transition, there are five major components. The first is social, and this is one that students love to talk about. 
I mean, this is where you can engage them. I know a lot of times you're talking to like a brick wall, you know, that I, I don't know how you do that every day where you talk to students and they look at you like you're from another planet speaking an entirely different language. Like that, I mean, congratulations, because I would, I would, you know, I probably would, uh, would, I wouldn't be employed. Uh, social. So the social is where do students find their way? Uh, how do you build relationships outside of the classroom? How do you interact? And that's a really, you know, dating relationships, friendships. Uh, most of most students have just found friends because poof, it's just happened. So that's a major area. Then you have the emotional transition, and the emotional transition is everything that happens between your ears. Okay, so it's everything that happens between your ears. And um, students, again, they struggle with the emotions. We are having a difficult time helping students to navigate all the, the big issues. And you can see the depression and the anxiety. Uh, it's so big. And students don't know how to express themselves. Next area of transition is the physical, actually being in a different space, being in a different location. And then there's also your physical being, your own health and well-being. So there's a social, emotional, and physical, which are huge. And they take up so much of the students' time and energy once they're on campus. Then you have the financial, which many of you touch on. And then there's, oh yeah, the academic. So the academic is the last one of, of, of the five major components. You are exceptional, and high schools are exceptional at focusing on the academic and financial. And it's a lot to focus on. But if you can incorporate the social, emotional, and physical and really tap into where are students motivated, well then it's going to make your life easier because they're going to be more intrinsically motivated. The five major areas of transition form an acronym, SEPFA. Okay, sorry if you have to clean your, uh, your screen. SEPFA. It's a good thing I turned the, the video off. But SEPFA it's a little better than FAFSA, but it's in the same school. Uh, SEPFA is the acronym, and SEPFA is the guide. It is the gateway to search and selection because transition is where we need to begin. These five areas, social, emotional, physical, financial, if you were to change academic and make it professional, which would be SEPFA, -p, which is, I can't even, I don't even think that's an acronym, but that would be your life. That would be my life. These are the areas where we're constantly maneuvering and working to be our best. And what we can do is help students to practice and understand how to navigate through this. I love this part. And this is something I really didn't even quite appreciate as deeply until I was really preparing for this. It's that, it's that there's already been a dramatic transition for your students. Like, you don't have to just work from scratch, okay? You have life experiences that students can draw from. And I know you do this when it comes to, you know, really starting uh, the broad strokes of search, but when you give it a name and you have a template and a process, it becomes a very different experience. So in high school, there's the social transition. How have students made their connections, found their friends, some through osmosis, some through groups and activities, and I'll dig a little deeper into the social component. Then there's the emotional transition, and I mean, I mean, going through puberty and dealing with everything that high school students deal with, I mean, every day is emotional. So how are they able to navigate the emotional? Some can do it better than others. There's the physical transition of going from one school to another, you can draw from. Then the financial, not as much during the uh, middle school to high school transition, but it's something you could still draw from. And then the academic transition. So you can see, and I mentioned this before, transitions, they repeat. It's part of our life. So it's really not that hard to incorporate transition into college planning because you already have a, a frame of reference, and the students that you're guiding have a frame of reference as well. Now, someone uh, posted that it's really hard to get parents to understand this, and I have resources to help you, and, um, and, and I'm going to be doing more to reach out to your parents because I know you need a partner. This is this is not just for you. And, and if you're working um, at a school, at a public school, or at a private school, uh, you, you, I know you have a lot on your plate, and you can't take on more. But if you incorporate transition into the earliest stages, 
and we give parents some tools and help them to understand that there is a crisis, there's an epidemic, and how can we start early to identify these elements of transition and prepare our students and, and prepare ourselves, then, then you can get them on board. They could invest. So how do you navigate transition? And, and this is a big, it's a big life question. And as an advice columnist and someone who marinates in my misery, I really struggled with this. I hate change. I hate change. I, I loathe it. And I've learned to tolerate it. And this formula, and I mean, at the end of the day, I do this stuff, you know, because I want to help people, but also, like, I, I just, I, I'm a worrier, I'm concerned, I'm introspective, I want to figure out these answers for myself. And what's so cool is you can take those elements of transition and you can apply these three Ps. And this will be the guide to help you to get comfortable with the uncomfortable during transition. The first thing is places. For every transition, you need to find three places. Where are the three places where you can find your connections and find support? Many of you are part of professional groups in your uh, professional lives. That's a place. Uh, many of you do things outside of your professional life that put you in rooms doing things you love to do. Where are your three places? Next, who are your five people? In life, we always need at least five people. Five people who can be there in our corner. Five people who can help us, to support us, who love us, who want us to do our best. You're one of these people. And I'm going to dig deeper into each component in just a couple slides. And then patience. We suck at being patient. I googled the word patience and I got 400 million results in half a second. And I was like, that's it? Only 400 million? <laughs> if Google takes me more than a minute, I'm like, Google, I hate you. We are so used to instant gratification, instant answers. And students with texting, with social networks, uh, you know, milliseconds, that we want answers that quickly. We're terrible at patience. But once we can set students up to be uncomfortable, meaning I'm going to help you to get comfortable with the uncomfortable while we go through this process, you can be more patient. And again, with these parents, Helping parents, and I'm a parent, and I hate when my kids are uncomfortable, but I recognize that uncomfortable is a gift. I'd rather have my kid be uncomfortable now when they're small children where I can help coach them and guide them than have them be far away in a place where I can't communicate with them, where I'm unsure of who the people um, they're surrounded, of the people around them. You know, I want to be close to them. We, we all do. Places, people, and patience. Those are the three big elements to navigate transition. So if you go a layer deeper and you look at places, and I'm going to bring this all together in some exercises that you can actually apply during your counseling. So places. Everyone needs at least three places where they can find connections to community and support. And each place gives students access to new people and new experiences. Having three places means that we always have options. And this is so key. I was doing an event at Wagner College in Staten Island. Really cool place, interesting place. And they have a lot of athletes there. Wagner draws from um, you know, states all over. Uh, I talked to all these students who were uh, tennis players from Florida. And um, then there were these, these football players. It was, it was a really interesting event. And the problem with athletes is they only have one place. And you've seen this with your students who have scholarships, is that if they're in a place and they can't find a connection, then they either come home or they hate where they are. Okay, But a student who has three places always has the power to say no and can make better choices in alignment with their values. They don't panic, they don't hate, they don't hide in their comfort zone. But it takes three places. Well, when it comes to incorporating transition into college planning, clubs, organizations, and activities, we can really draw from those places. And then you can focus on the academic places, the social places, and the spiritual places. When looking at these places, it's really important. It's really important for students to also recognize where are the places that I can participate in where I don't need to be accepted, because sometimes there's that um, sometimes there's that uh, you know, audition, or you have to get into a fraternity or sorority, 
where was I? I was at, uh, I think I was at Lehigh the other day, and, and Greek life is so big, and they said, you know, if you're not part of Greek life, if you rush and you don't get accepted, then you're devastated. And uh, I said, oh, okay, I, I get that, because you don't have more than one place, and I got that. When I was rejected from my fraternity at Wisconsin, I had no place. Um, spiritual organizations are great, because if you're in a Bible study group, it's not like they're going to reject you. Like there aren't auditions for Bible study, and if there are auditions, that is one intense Bible study program. But uh, typically, you 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 are uh, welcome and can be accepted. So you can draw from the past wherever you found your places. And what's nice is when you use this places uh, um, template, students who have no place in high school, it gives them some motivation and encouragement to find a place and um, be able to really figure out how to engage. Next, you have your people. For every problem, there are at least five people who can offer support and guidance. I love this picture. Um, it was really funny. I was in Madison the other day, and I stopped these people. And this girl, she she wanted nothing to do with me. I think she thought I was selling her something or trying to recruit her for something. But I told her what I do, and um, I said I wrote a book called Naked Roommate, which is probably creepier than actually, um, you know. <laughs> Just, maybe I shouldn't use the word naked when talking to strangers, but um, this guy actually knew the book, which was nice, and they stopped, and I said, can I take your picture? And they said, yeah, and um, they had just done some volunteer work, which is cool. Uh, people. We all need people in our corner, okay? No one tells us this. When my girlfriend broke up with me and shot the puppy, I had no people, and for me, I was even more disconnected because there wasn't all the technology to connect me and to help me to be in my comfort zone. When it comes to people, there are three types of people you're going to help students identify. People who are paid to help. Many of you are paid to help. People who volunteer to help. There are lots of students who work in the admissions department who are happy to volunteer, uh, graduates as well. And then people who are enlisted to help, people we ask to help. A lot of students are intimidated when it comes to asking for help, but we can solve that problem as well. You can have your admissions contacts give you a list of people who are friendly, who will never say no who want to help so that your students aren't afraid. And then you can also f have some alumni network. And um, I know many of you do uh, have an alumni network where, um, I forget who was telling me in NACAC, where every person you you um, you know graduates, uh, you stay in touch with them, and then you even have the first year students talk to the, um, you know, the seniors and the juniors, which is such a cool thing to do. And if any of you do this, um, in the question box, just write what you do, because what we'll do is we'll take this and we'll put this in the blog. You know, do you do do you do um, do you have a do you have a program where your graduates can talk to your current students, and how do you facilitate this? Uh, Facebook is another way that you can do this, and it's really easy to do that as well. So people, that's this, the second piece. And the third piece is patience. You know, finding the right places and people takes time, and this is where that whole uncomfortable piece is so key. It takes a good year or two to really find your way during a transition. If you think about your life transitions, two years, really. Two years to really find your people and places. So if we can help students to understand this and parents to understand this, when they're eight weeks in and they say, this place sucks. This is awful. I hate this. Everything's terrible. My roommate and I don't get along. My classes are boring, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lonely and homesick. Uh, we could say, good. These are all natural, normal things. What can you do to make this place more comfortable? How can you find your people? How can you find your places? But only students who recognize that transition is uncomfortable, they're going to have the patience to be able to navigate this next step. So let's go a little bit deeper and I'm being really aware of time I'm gonna I'm gonna push through some of this a little bit faster so that I have plenty of time for your questions so how do you integrate transition into your college planning okay you introduce college planning as a three-part process early early into this early into this you know during those first year the freshman year when they when they first sign up when you're first meeting with students and parents it's search selection and transition and what you do is you begin planning with transition and you can use high school experiences as a guide to navigate transition. Then it becomes really easy. You help students identify the places and people that have made their lives in high school successful in each of those five areas, social, emotional, physical, financial, and academic. 
So where are the three places socially where you found connections? Where are the three places emotionally where you were able to find support? Where are the three places physically where you really were able to do things you love to do and, and be able to, to nurture yourself and take care of yourself financially and academically? So you take those, those areas and you let that be what dictates the conversation. And this will also be helpful for you for your initial consults when you're able to um, you know, drill down and, um, and start this. And students, they like talking about this a, a lot more than just you know, the ether of, of the big picture of what this change is. So use transition as a guide during search and selection and let this process reveal the best fit for each student. And I know your parents need to hear this and I can make a YouTube video if you'd like that just says this again and again. It's that the best school for a student might not be the best school according to a parent or rankings. Okay, It's about finding a fit that sticks. And this idea of finding a fit that sticks, it's different than finding a fit because you know, we can find fits, but where can a student really thrive? And the best college experience really begins at high school by identifying your people and places and approaching this with reasonable expectations so you can be patient. And if you have any questions about this, if you have any tools that you, that you would like me to create, uh, let me know because uh, this, is, this is what I'm doing uh, and I want to serve you and help to make your lives easier because I know how busy you are. So here's an actionable exercise that you can actually use to help guide your students. So how do you use transition to drive search and selection? So now taking everything that we've discussed, you have your students rank the five areas of transition, the social, emotional, physical, financial, and academic, from most important to least important. So they get a chance to rank. This isn't about what their parents uh, want to rank. And it would also be interesting because you can have the parents do it too. And, and when you see what the parents do and the students do, that creates a great um, um, reality TV show <laughs> of like crazy rage. Um, no, but you can use that as a guide to really help to um, have some healthy conversations. So they rank these from, from um, most important to least important. Then next, the students identify the three places where they can explore finding connections to campus. And I'm going to walk you through this in the next slide using the social transition. And then students identify five people who can answer their questions. And if you have a pool of people that they can reach out to, it makes it far less daunting because I know students hate rejection. They're terrible at taking risks. You know, how, what, where, when, who. And it's fun to go through the questions. The students can actually come up with their questions. I've contemplated coming up with a template, but I think it, will, it would be really beneficial for students to, to ask those questions. Like, what do you want to know? Um, where do you see yourself? Um, let's put those together and let's find you those people that you can talk to in a safe environment. And then you have students identify where they can be the most patient while getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And the truth is there are some students who are not as emotionally ready to navigate this transition. So let me give you one more exercise. And this is the, this is the final piece of how you can actually apply this. And again, we're going to have all these slides so that you can go through this piece by piece. And again, let me know what I can do to support you and help you. So let's take the social transition. Okay, there was the social, emotional, physical, financial, and academic. Let's take the social and let's break this down. So your, your student says social is the most important thing for me. I really want to be at a place where I can find friends, be close to my long distance girlfriend. You know, we, we want to actually listen to them. That's important. So let's focus on making new friends, really finding connections on campus. Where are the three places on campus you can do the things you love to do with people who share similar interests? And you can use the, um, you know, the academic, the social, the spiritual uh, organizations as a way to, to help them to identify these places. But they actually go on the website. They actually go on the campus website or they can talk to the admissions counselor if there's already a, a point of contact and they can actually identify these places. And this can be done early in search, you know, so they can really be focused. I talked to a student at a university who was a debate champion and he was at a school that had no debate program. It's crazy because students don't think along these lines of where am I going to find these places. It makes it so much easier. If someone had asked me where are the places that you can find your way, what did you do in high school, oh, it would have been so easy. I would have loved Madison, but not in the winter. It's cold. Um, so during this first step of this exercise, students identify clubs, organizations, activities, what would you like to experience, explore interests based on what you've done in the past. Then 
who are five people in each place who can answer your questions. What's nice about the internet and the way these, these clubs and organizations are set up, uh, you can see these people. Uh, there's always an advisor who a student can reach out to. Then there are the executive board members. And if a student's tentative and afraid of talking to these individuals, they can you can again use those points of contact at these specific schools and say, hey, I've got a kid who's interested in this, this, and this. Can you get me a few people who we can reach out to or she can reach out to so that you don't have to spend your time? Um, people who are paid, people who volunteer, people who are enlisted to help. If emotional transition is a big deal, well, then that student needs to have a psychologist, psychiatrist, or therapist, or psychologist on a campus. Uh, that's really important. They need to be supported. And just having a counseling office isn't enough. We want them to know the people. We want them to identify those people before they make that change. And then how patient will you need to be while finding your places? Students ask five people in their corner how long it took for them so they can create a realistic timeline to navigate through this change. So those are some exercises. I've given you a lot. We've moved really quickly through this. I want to make sure I get to your questions. So I want to, um, I'm going to wrap up the resources part a little bit faster, but I want you to know they're there. Uh, and um, again, I want to know what, what resources I can help to support you um, with along the way. So the impact of this process, the impact of this, of, of, of putting transition first, students, who can identify their places are engaged, empowered, they can make strong choices in alignment with their values. There's a reason that um, schools with, with these, with these you know, strong values bring me in because I'm about helping students get comfortable with the uncomfortable so they can find their places, find their people, and make great choices and be strong. Next, students with five people in their corner, they're supported and prepared to face challenges. They're equipped to be leaders in their community. When students hurt themselves, when students run, when students hide, when students attack, when students blame, they don't have people and they don't have places. So how could we make sure that the dynamics are in place so that they can thrive? Students who are patient, they don't panic, run, hate, hide, make excuses, they give themselves permission to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, and they work at a more forgiving pace. And many of you with exceptional students, they are relentless in beating themselves up Let's change their self-talk so that they have t room and time to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And all of this, everything I'm mentioning here, it's also for parents. It's also for parents. So the resources. I'm going to run through these resources, and then I'm going to answer your questions. So I've created an online course for students. It's a free course, and I've broken it up to make it very easy for you to use each question, each part of it as a discussion point. So you can uh, have access to this for free, share it with your students, five questions every student must ask to pick the perfect college, and it's, it's all web-based. And you can sign up at nakedroommate.com and at harlancone.com. And again, it's, it's a free course and any feedback, I'm always open to feedback as well. Then, I want to help your parents. I know that's a huge pain point from speaking with many of you. This five simple rules for college parents. It's another online course. It's a free online course that I've made available through your naked roommate, harlancone.com. Uh, and um, this could be five simple rules for high school parents. Okay. And the five simple rules are basically helping parents to be on board so that they can allow their children to uh, be uncomfortable and to still be the best parents in the world. The best parents allow their kids to struggle and they can help their kids to be self-advocates. So I hope you'll check that out. You can also share this with parents as well and use it as a, as a, as a, as a um, you know, discussion tool. Then in the spring, uh, this, I got a huge program I'm launching. It's a Naked Roommate College boot camp for students and parents. And these are 50 self-contained lessons that break down every component of the college experience, social, emotional, physical, financial, academic, and these are funny, fast-paced with music underneath. And again, these are going to be a great tool that can be incorporated into the classroom. Students can do on their own. And um, when you sign up for any of these courses, I'll make sure to give you a professional discount when this comes out. So I am pumped up. I am, this is the most exciting thing I've ever done. I am, it's going to help millions of people. And um, I just can't wait. Now, uh, the books, I'm going to run through these quickly because many of you have these. If you don't, now you will be familiar. These are not just tools to help students transition to college, and they're not just tools for roommates. The roommate part is very small. This is about uh, helping students to thrive. 
And the way the books are constructed and the way the workbook's constructed, they really um, give you tools to engage students so that they can navigate all of those big areas of transition. Um, this book is being used as a textbook. We also have the workbook, which has a high school um, uh, has a high school uh, curriculum. Okay, so you can inquire uh, through me or through Pete at Source Books. But there's a whole um, curriculum that you can incorporate for the last week or month when students tune out and they have senioritis. So that will be great. Uh, help students identify important issues, the p people, places, anticipate obstacles, and then you've got your exercises. And I'm going to leave this on for just one second. There's a roommate contract that you can share, which is dynamic, and I wish I had time to dig into that. And then there's a three places workbook exercise as well. And for bulk orders on any of these books, talk to Pete. He was at NACAC, and uh, he can help you if you're ordering, you know, whatever you're ordering, call him, and he can help you because we really want to serve you and get you the, the, the most aggressive uh, discounts and support you in every way. So there's the Naked Roommate book for students and then I also wrote this book for parents because so many parents are reading Naked Roommate. Uh, I want to give them something of their own. Parents who have a baseline of what's normal, they are so much better equipped to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. They don't have to blame you. They don't have to blame their kid. They don't have to blame the college when they're dealing with these changes. They can blame this natural transition. Florida State University gave out I think 3,500 copies of this book and many other schools are giving this out as well. But I think high school's parents should read this because it's going to help set the tone for transition. Then I also visit, I'm going to be super fast with this because I want to get to your questions. I'm dying to get to your questions. Um, I visit colleges, I visit universities, I visit high schools and I've been working more and more with top high schools. I'll work with your parents, I'll work with your students, I'll sit down, listen to some of the pain points, the needs, what you want to address and I'll help you. Um, I'm going to be going to New Jersey, I think, to do something more on the emotional transition. Uh, whatever you need, I can talk to you and we can have a phone conversation. This is my speaking page, which has all of this info. Um, when it comes to some of the issues you can't always talk about in, in um, high school, like, um, like um, you know, the Title IX, the sexual health and, and consent and those issues, I also can help students because um, they're not getting that every day, uh, these conversations in high school. So the summary is, let's change this conversation. It's about search, selection, and transition. Three big areas. Transition consists of five parts, social, emotional, physical, financial, and academic. Places, people, and patients as the template to navigate all transitions. When you use transition as a guide to search and selection, students are connected, supported before stepping foot on campus. They're intrinsically motivated. and Guided Path, a wonderful partner. So grateful to be able to partner with Guided Path to bring this to you. Um, they're a wonderful partner to help you to be able to manage transition and to get you the tools you need so that you will be able to focus on the things that are important to you while integrating what I think is the most important part of this, uh, of this experience. We're going to get to questions, but I want you to know that you can share this. You can share this with your friends and colleagues, with anybody who you think will benefit from this. The webinar is going to be broadcast on the Guided Path YouTube channel. I'll also have a link at harlancone.com. The questions and answers will be posted on Cindy's blog. And we also have, oh, I want to go back. So close. I want to go back because I want to make sure you have this. We're, I was almost so smooth when it comes to going through this. Let's see. We'll do the summary. Isn't it amazing? When you get to the end, you're just so close to having everything be seamless. So you can access these resources. Let me make sure you have Cindy's blog. We're going to post the Q&A. PowerPoint's going to be on SlideShare. We're going to send you emails. And if you like this topic, please sign up for the Guided Path newsletter. So now, finally, I would love to get to your questions. I'm going to leave this up while I answer these questions. Uh, this is how you can stay connected to me. Uh, enough of me talking. Your questions, Cindy. What what do we have? Hi, Harlan. That was so great, and it generated some really good comments and some questions. So, 
Um, and what we're going to do too, if any questions that we don't get to, we'll put together in a Q&A and post those as well. So you're going to get the webinar, as Harlan said, you know, the slides and this Q&A. So it's got my head turning. I know many of you, you're thinking about things as well. So one of the first questions um, somebody asked is, what about introverts versus extroverts? You know, we have students who may not be as comfortable going out and finding the person places and you know or they probably have a little more patience than, um, you know or maybe not but what about do you have any differences or things versus um, types of student personalities for helping sure. them to go through this absolutely so we need to support those students to make it comfortable for them and one way to make it comfortable is to give them a role not like a role with sesame seeds but like a role like defining their role and if their role is they have to do something as part of an assignment then it becomes easier for them to do that and that's something that can be assigned through a uh, English course or it can be something that's done as part of, of the counseling process and the planning process another way to do it is um, you have those students come to the more shy students and uncomfortable students and even during a, a, a homeroom or time where, where seniors meet, have those students who are people uh, who have had life experiences, they can come in and they can come to that student. Um, also, uh, jobs are really great, you know, part-time jobs. Um, students who are shy, I always tell them, get a job. And a job puts you in a place where you have a role and you have to say something and you have to do things. So that's another technique. Also, if there's a student who's so painfully shy and uncomfortable, if they have some type of additional help or support, or if they're seeing a therapist, I think as part of the therapy, having them do these small little exercises um, so that they can reach out and do it in a safe way. You can also have them do it anonymously, you know, where you can pose questions in a way where other people can answer them. Um, I know a lot of students like to be anonymous because they're, they're painfully afraid of what other people are going to think. So those are just a few ways. And... Um, I see so many of these students. Oh, one more thing. With the shy students, those bridge programs, those summer programs, mm -hmm. any additional program where they can be part of a, a leadership uh, you know, core, like at Boulder, I was at CU Boulder and they had this stampede, which is a week-long program before actual first year orientation. So that's another great way um, after selection to really help them to integrate. And I think if, you, if we can help them find that person in places, that's going to benefit them more than you know, those particular students even more. Mm -hmm. And they can remain they have an anchor. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it gives them an anchor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they and they, they desperately need that. At nakedroommate.com, I have um, like a thousand people who have identified themselves as friendly. There's actually a question in their profile, and they say the question is, are you are you um, comfortable and willing to answer questions from random people about college? And they say yes. So so they make it very clear that I'm not going to reject you and I'm happy to answer questions. Very cool. So Colleen says, seems like we're, when we're planning, kids can only draw on their high school experiences and might not know what will make them happy in college. You know, they're, they're going from what they know into the unknown. So how do you, how do students prioritize when they, they're basing those priorities on past experience and what may be better for them in the future experience may be different. What do you I think that is so that? great that they have experiences to draw from. It doesn't matter what they want to do. It doesn't matter what their mission is in life. All we do is start with the few things that have given them pleasure, that they've enjoyed, and let that be the first step to help them. Because once they're in a room doing things they love to do with people they share similar interests with, something else is going to come up. And it's only the student who is in a place where they're interacting and engaging who's going to discover these other individuals who have these passions, who invite them to participate. So a parent who says, you know, my kid really likes soccer, they're not going to be a professional soccer player, I say, you know what, they should be an intramural soccer, and they can live in a floor that's like a living and learning community with people who share similar interests, and they're going to build relationships with the right types of people by being engaged and involved. The first year is, is exploring. So let them do something, something that they love or enjoy. And then while they're looking at the college or university that has the things that they enjoy doing, 
they're going to find some other places that they find intriguing and then we can help them to start engaging in those areas before they even arrive on campus. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, another question, and this, you really, I mean, you're shifting the paradigm and helping people to think about this from a whole new perspective. Um, but so in, in line with that, they'll ask, how do you suggest bridging the divide between what the students want most, finding the perfect college, and what parents want most, how they are going to pay for it? These are two ends of the spectrum. So, that, I love that. I that, love that whole financial. Yeah, I love that because when parents rank, which of the five areas of transition are most important to them, you know, financial is usually on the top of the list. And and rarely is financial the most important to to the student. And what's really exciting about this approach is that when a student has a different priority than a parent, what the student can do is identify people who come from a similar background who have faced similar challenges. And this is where you can use your admissions contacts to identify some interesting people. So if a school is out of reach, you know, before we shut that down, why don't you encourage the student to reach out to people who have been there and done it? And addressing the fact that finance is important, mom and dad, I get that, and we, and we know it's important, but let's just do this as an exercise. Why doesn't uh, you know Harlan reach out to some people who have had similar financial uh, challenges who are at this school and see what it's actually like. And then the parent can have a better concept and the student can have a better concept. You know, we're able to validate the financial part is huge. What's also really cool about this approach is that when a student really can identify how they can find their way, there are so many schools that are exceptional. Like exceptional students could be exceptional anywhere. I know letting a student, you know, having a student release themselves of this is a challenge, but if they go through this process where they apply to all these schools, then they're in the stage of selection. Okay, selection is great because you can really use this people, places, and patients uh, model to really drill down and find the best place, and also talk about the finances. So the student who um, is is living that life and the prospective student reaches out to that student and that student then can give an honest assessment, the assessment might also reflect what the parents are saying as well. So we want verifiable information from the right people who are living that life, but also acknowledge everybody's um, everybody's concerns. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And, you know, as I look at the, the model that you've presented and I think about all these different aspects, you know, that's why what we've got covered in Guided Path is we have where students can look at the social. Like we'll have where do, the, where do students hang out? They want to know what they're doing on campus, you know, and where do people go and what are some events. So we have, we recognize that that's a big part of what the students need. So we've got things from the social, the emotional, the physical, the financial, and the academic, and it all creates that that cohesive whole. And I think using the model that you've presented then helps us put all those pieces together. So we have one more question and then we're going to close this for today. And again, thank everyone for being here. And look, check your emails. Um, we'll be sending these out uh, with the links to all the recordings. It'll probably come next week. Give us a couple of days to get this all put together. And then sign up for our newsletter because we offer webinars. Where have a break in November, but then we're going to start a whole financial aid series and um, starting in December. So December, January, February, we're going to be talking about scholarships and financial aid, things like that. So Harlan, the last question is, is from Kathy, and she says, is there a way you can make those online courses available so we can send them directly to our students and parents? So uh, how, yeah. is, how do the online courses, how do you, how are those managed and how do they work? And how, right. give us a little bit more information about that. Sure. So everything is web-based. So I have it all uh, on my website, and people are able to, you know, they land on the page and they get access. And then I have it where, after going through a couple modules, they include their email address, where they have access to the rest of them. But we'll give you those links. We can include that. Mm -hmm. um, and the previous slide, the the uh, the Harlan Cohen slide. Uh, you can. Oh, I keep going back. I should just leave this thing alone. 
Um, but anyway, you can find uh, you can find it at harlancone.com and at nakedroommate.com. And um, if you have any problems, you can just send me an email, and I'll make sure that I get it to you. Great. Great. We'll send it out through. We'll put it on the newsletter. We'll we'll make sure that you have access to it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So everyone, have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you for taking this time out to spend with us. And you know, you can share this links as we post these. We know sometimes it's easier to watch webinars and things at your convenience. And we know we have people across the globe that are participating. So feel free to share this. Use it for staff trainings, meetings, you know, working with your parents. That's what Harlan's goal is. That's what our goal is at Guided Path. Um, and look forward to seeing you on our next webinar, which will be in December. So Harlan, thank you very much. This has been great. Um, we always appreciate learning and hearing from you, and I'm very excited about what you have to share, and we want to take this and implement this with our students and parents, and I know we're all working with them and, um, and appreciate the insights that you give us. So this concludes our webinar today. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, We'll look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you, everybody.